Okay, so you're looking to get up to speed on the CSR 2501 exam, right? And I bet you want to do it without, you know, drowning in a sea of textbooks. That's where we come in. Exactly. This deep dive, what we're aiming for is to pull out the absolute key nuggets of knowledge from, oh, well, we've got some practice questions here for the SAP certification exam. Right. We've got the sort of the exam details and... Uh, a bunch of practice questions. So what we're going to do is kind of like dissect these, not just tell you the right answer, but, you know, get into the why, like what's the concept that they're really testing here? Yeah. Think of it as a like a targeted prep. We're not just going to throw flashcards at you. We really want to explain why a student answer is correct and what that tells you about the core things they're testing you on. Yeah. And, you know, just so we're all on the same page, when we talk about a story, in this context, uh, we're talking about, you know, like a presentation or a dashboard that you're building in SAP Analytics Cloud. It's like, you know, that's the canvas. That's where we're working. Exactly. So let's jump right in. Yeah. Let's dive into question number one. All right. So first question. For which activities must you enable advanced mode in story design? And just a heads up, there are two correct answers to this question. Okay. So your options are A, add custom scripting for dynamic interactions. B, implement conditional formatting in a table. C, add an interactive pop-up message. D, create a hyperlink to an external data source. Hmm. When you glance at these, what kind of jumps out as something that might need that, that extra power of advanced mode? Well, A and C both sound like they need something more than just your basic interface. Okay. And you'd be right. The correct answers are A and C. Huh. And this really gets at the core idea. Advanced mode. That's your ticket when you need to do things that go beyond the, you know, the ready-made features in story design. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's dig into A a little bit. Add custom scripting for dynamic interaction. So, you know, we can add things in stories, but what is it about scripting that kind of takes it to the next level? Think of it this way. The standard story design tools, they're really good. They're powerful, but they kind of work within certain uh, preset limits. Right. Scripting lets you break free from those limits and create really unique, you know, things that react to events like custom behaviors. So say you have a button, right? When you click it, you don't just want to filter a chart. Maybe you also want to send an email alert. Or maybe you need a very specific animation to really highlight a trend. Oh, interesting. The explanation, it even mentions like updating charts based on what the user does or, yeah. you know, triggering actions, that kind of complex multi-step interaction. A lot of times you need to actually write code for that. And that's where advanced mode comes in. So yeah. if you need to go beyond just dragging and dropping and you want to make things happen in a really specific way, that's when, you know, flip that advanced mode switch. I see. So it's like, uh, I don't know if this is the right analogy, but it's like using a calculator with preset functions versus like actually programming the calculator to do much more complex things. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Okay. And then the second correct answer, C, add an interactive pop-up message. What's the difference between a regular pop-up and an interactive one, and why would that need advanced mode? Well, it's a responsiveness. Yeah. A simple pop-up that just shows some text, that's one thing. Yeah. But if you want a pop-up to, like, appear based on what the user is doing, like maybe it pops up when they hover over a certain data point or after uh -huh. they make a specific selection. Oh, I see. That means you got to define what triggers the pop-up and how it should behave, and yeah. you need logic for that. And often you got to use scripting to control exactly when and how that pop-up appears mm. and what it shows, you know, based on what's happening in the story. Mm -hmm. It's not just showing information. It's about making it engaging, making it relevant to what the user is doing. Right. So it's about the when and the how. It appears when something specific happens and it reacts to the user. And to have that level of control, you need advanced mode. Okay, so the key takeaway here, advanced yeah. mode in story design, it's not just like an on-off switch. Right. It's really about, like you said, unlocking those custom logic and dynamic behaviors that go beyond just the standard features. Exactly. All right, well, let's move on to kind of how users interact with the story once it's built. Okay. Our second question is, what can input controls be used for in a story? Again, two correct answers here. Right. Options. A, adjusting data aggregation levels dynamically. B, applying user-defined filters to specific visualizations. C, modifying data relationships between tables. D, defining page layout and design. So when you think about like someone using a story and interacting with the data, which of these stand out? 
And B, they seem to really give the user the ability to kind of play with the data they're seeing. Yeah, I think you're right. A and B are the correct answers. So let's look at A, adjusting data aggregation levels dynamically. Right. What does that actually mean for the person using a story? What's the benefit? Imagine you're looking at sales figures. Yeah. Right. At first, you might see the total revenue for the whole year. Okay. But what if you want to quickly switch to see the average sales per month? Or the total number of units sold. Input controls let you the person using the story, switch between those different summaries, like sum, average, count, all that. You don't need the designer to create separate reports. I see. It's like giving the user their own little mini analysis tools. They don't have to ask for new reports. You save time as the designer. Yeah. It gives people a ton of flexibility to explore the data from different angles. Ah, uh, so it gives the power to the user to decide how they want to summarize the data, basically. Exactly. Okay, and then B... Applying user-defined filters to specific visualizations. So we all kind of know about filtering data, but how do input controls make that even better? It's the user-defined part and the interactive part. Mm. The designer can add filters beforehand, but input controls, they're like these interactive levers that the user can directly control to focus in on the data that matters most to them at that moment. Oh. Like say they only want to see sales for a specific region or for a certain type of product, input controls let them apply those filters on the fly just by clicking or selecting right there in the story. Huh. It makes those reports much more personalized and actionable. Right, it makes it their own. Okay, so to sum up, input controls and stories, it's all about giving the end user the ability to really dive in and filter the data, making it super relevant to their specific needs. That's it. Okay. Well, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about efficiency, specifically when it comes to planning. Question three, how can you improve data entry efficiency in a planning story? Two correct answers here. Got it. Your options are A, enable mass data entry mode for tables, B, use predictive forecasting features, C, set up multiple data entry sheets in a single story, D, enable auto calculation for dependent values. So out of those, which ones sound like they would really streamline that whole data entry process, which can be, you know, kind of a pain sometimes? A and B, those seem like they'd really cut down on manual work. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. A and B are the correct answers. Let's break down. A, enable mass data entry mode for tables. What's so great about this feature? What does it actually do? Think about times when you have to update a bunch of data points all at once. Maybe you're adjusting budgets across different departments or putting in sales forecasts for like tons of products. Right. Mass data entry mode lets you type those values right into multiple cells in a table all at the same time. You don't have to do them one by one. Oh, that's nice. The explanation points out it saves a ton of time and effort, especially with those big data sets that need updates all the time. Right. It's just about making those updates way faster and less tedious. Yeah, no one likes that tedious stuff. Okay, so that makes a lot of sense. Now, B, the second correct answer, use predictive forecasting features. How does that play into making data entry more efficient? It almost sounds like it's doing the work for you. Well, it kind of is. Predictive forecasting, it uses algorithms, you know, like computer smarts, yeah. to look at your past data and spot patterns and trends. And then based on that, it can suggest what the future values might be. It doesn't completely replace human input. You still need to double check and adjust. Yeah. But it takes away a lot of the manual guesswork. You don't have to sit there and estimate every value based on gut feeling. Yeah, yeah. The system gives you these smart suggestions backed up by data. And it can actually make your forecasts more accurate too. So you save time and you potentially get better planning results. That's great. So data entry efficiency and planning stories, it's about speeding up that manual entry with mass entry mode, but also using predictions to just cut down on how much manual entry you have to do in the first place. Okay, let's think about collaborating with others now. Question four throws you a little scenario. You need to collaborate with a team member on a story that's stored in the public folder. What should you do? Options. A, send a direct share link via email. B, assign a collaboration task in SAP Analytics Cloud. C, adjust the story's permissions to include edit access for the user. D, export the story to a PDF and share it externally. So in that situation, what's the most like direct and effective way to let your coworker actually work on the story with you, you know, right there in the system? C, adjust the story's permissions to include edit access for the user. Mm. That sounds like it just gives them the power to change things, right? I think so too, and that's actually the correct answer. Why wouldn't the other options work so well in this case? Okay, so sending a share link, option A, usually that lets someone view the story, but not necessarily change it. Assigning a task, like an option B, 
that's great for getting feedback or starting a review, but it doesn't automatically give them the ability to edit. And then exporting to PDF, option D, well, that makes a static document. It's not interactive anymore. You can't really collaborate on it. Right. It's just a snapshot. Yeah. And the key here is it's in a public folder. Mm -hmm. Those folders might have some default restrictions on who can do what. So you got to go in and specifically change the permissions in SAP Analytics Cloud to give your team member edit access. That's the most straightforward way to make sure they can actually work on the story with you. So collaboration in public stories, it all boils down to managing those permissions right there in SAP Analytics Cloud so you can all edit and work together. Exactly. All right, last question. This one's about getting really specific with how we calculate things. Question five is, which feature allows you to apply custom calculations at the cell level in a table within a story? Options. A, dynamic aggregation rules. B, custom calculation scripts. C, advanced table formulas. D, hierarchy-based measure calculations. So this sounds like, you know, going beyond just like basic calculations and getting really granular with the numbers. Yeah, it does. Out of those options, which one would give you that kind of precise control, you know, cell by cell? Advanced table formulas, that one, option C. That seems like it lets you do those really specific calculations. You got it. That is the correct answer. Can you give us some examples of what kind of things you could do with these advanced table formulas? What's cool about them is they give you so much control at that granular level. Normal calculations, they usually work on whole rows or columns. But with these formulas, you can define calculations that only apply to specific cells. Like the explanation mentions calculating what percentage a cell represents of its row total, or using logic to make a cell show different values depending on what's in another cell. Oh, wow. You can even build these complicated financial models with calculations that pull in values from other specific cells in the table. It's about having the freedom to do really tailored analysis and present your data in a way that's super precise and insightful. So using custom calculations in tables with these advanced table formulas, you can move beyond just those standard calculations and create really customized, super insightful views of your data right down to each individual cell. Think about how these concepts connect to other topics you're going to encounter in the CSC 1201 exam. Yeah, good idea. Keep exploring and best of luck with your exam.